Peter's second epistle, chapter 1, verses 3 through 11. You know the word of the Lord as he speaks through the apostle Peter. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fail. For in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is God's holy and inspired word. Often when considering what passage we're going to be reading for our New Testament reading, you know, the main sermon text in the evening service, I just kind of flip through the Westminster Confession of Faith. I look at the paragraph and I use one of the numerous proof text that they give us to better understand the doctrine that is being taught. There were several proof texts provided, but as I considered more and more this paragraph that we confessed earlier, I kept going back to Peter's second epistle, chapter 1, verses 3 through 11. It's a pretty heavy section of the epistle. If you consider it, we've become partakers of the divine nature We've escaped the corruption that is in the world. We must supplement our faith with all these things that he listed. And if these qualities are increasing in our lives, then we can be fruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But whoever lacks these has basically forgotten that he's been saved already. And then he says this, make, your, make sure that uh, to be diligent to confirm your calling and election. And if you practice these qualities you will never fall, and in the end, will gain entrance into the eternal kingdom of Jesus Christ. This is some heavy stuff that Peter begins this epistle to, and as I'm looking at chapter 13, paragraph 3 on sanctification, as I'm considering this passage, I see them coming together. Even though it's not a proof text, even though this isn't one of the things that the divines gave us, I can't think of a better passage that really highlights what the Westminster divines are teaching concerning the doctrine of sanctification. And so I broke one of my rules. Normally I just grab one of those little uh, proof texts, and I can't think of a time over the last three years where I didn't use a proof text. So this is, this is a really special thing here tonight, what we're doing. Aren't you happy you came? This is a big deal. Here in this passage, we see exactly what the divines are talking about. In particular, the continual war that goes on in the believer. The war of the flesh and the spirit, whereby the power of our Lord Jesus Christ enables us to overcome sin and sinful inclinations so that we would grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ to the practice of true holiness. So the purpose of the sermon is this. In the war of the flesh and the spirit that goes on in the Christian, that war really is called sanctification. It's the sanctifying spirit of Christ who enables us to grow 
in grace and holiness. In the war that goes on in the believer, which is sanctification, in that war that's going on inside of us, the sanctifying spirit of Christ enables us to grow in grace and holiness. And in order to see this, first we'll do some review as we reflect on the doctrine of sanctification and that spiritual war going on within. Second, we'll look at the sanctifying spirit of Christ. And third, how he enables Christians to grow in grace and holiness throughout this spiritual war. So let's begin with sanctification and the spiritual war within. So let's give a definition. What is sanctification? What is sanctification? What are we talking about when we use this word, when we see this word? Well, if you recall, there are two kinds of sanctification in Scripture. You remember this? There's two kinds of sanctification. The first we generally call regeneration. So sometimes when you're reading the Bible and you see the word sanctification being used by one of the apostles, they're actually not talking about that daily dying to sin. They're talking about that initial being made holy by the power of the Holy Spirit. Regeneration. For example, Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 and following, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You have been justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. So when Paul uses that term sanctified, he's not referring to the continual, lifelong process of dying to our sin and being conformed to the image of Christ. He's talking about our regeneration, which is that one-time act of God who brings us into Christ and makes us holy, who gives us new life in Christ, new hearts, new minds, faith to repent and believe and be justified. So initial sanctification... Initial sanctification is regeneration. As we read in the first paragraph of chapter 13, several weeks ago, they who are effectually called and regenerated, having a new heart and a new spirit created in them, are, here it is, are further sanctified. Further sanctified. What's that first part of sanctification? It's regeneration. Having been regenerated, we are further sanctified truly and personally through the virtue of Christ's death and resurrection by his word and spirit dwelling in us. So initial sanctification is being made holy in our regeneration. And as they give us our definition of sanctification, they're assuming we already know that. But progressive sanctification, progressive, usually that's not a good word, right? But here it is. Progressive sanctification is the daily dying to sin, hating our sin, giving no quarter for sin, fleeing from it, putting it to death, and being made alive in Christ, being conformed to his image and true righteousness and holiness. This is progressive sanctification. And usually, 99.3% of the time we talk about sanctification here, that's what we're talking about. God uses means in order to do this? What are the means that he has given us in order to be sanctified? I bet you could take a guess. Word, sacrament, and prayer. And by tending to the means of grace, his word and his spirit work through the gospel. The gospel is shown forth in the Lord's Supper. And as we lift up our prayers and our praises, God sanctifies his people. And this progressive lifelong process of being made holy consists of two parts. You remember the two parts? Mortification and vivification. Mortification and vivification. In other words, putting sin to death to mortify the desires of the flesh 
and living unto Christ. Being, putting them to death and being made alive in Christ. And is this mortification and vivification? This is easy, right? This is an easy process. No, it's not, it's not an easy process. No, it's a war. It's called, it's called the war of sanctification. It's not easy. And I'm not the one calling it a war. The divines aren't the one calling it a war. It's the apostles who have called it a war. This is the battle. Putting sin to death isn't easy. That's why it's called a war. Sanctification is not, as I've said before, a tea party. It's not playing patty cake. It's a war. You have to do battle with your sin. Sanctification is throughout in the whole man, yet imperfect in this life. That's why we always, almost every single Sunday morning, we hear, he who says he has no sin is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Because sanctification is not perfect in this life, because there abideth still some remnants of corruption in every part. Whence ariseth a continual and irreconcilable war, the flesh against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh. A continual and irreconcilable war. That means the war is going to continue until we're dead. Or until Christ returns. Or until we're dead. There's not a peace treaty for this battle, this war. It carries on the flesh and the spirit doing battle. As Paul says in Romans 7.18, For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh, for I have the desire to do what is right. Why does he have the desire to do what is right? Because he's regenerate. Because Paul is a Christian. Did you know that? Paul's a Christian when he's writing Romans 7. That actually surprises some people because the argument of some is that he's acting. He's pretending. He's putting on a show. He's saying, I'm pretending like I'm not a believer yet as I write Romans 7. That's the argument of, I'm not going to name denominations, but most of them. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. I have the desire to do what is right. I have the desire because I'm regenerate. But I don't have the ability to carry it out. Why not, Paul? Because of the war. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but the sin that dwells in me. That's the remaining corruption. That's the indwelling sin even in the regenerate. So Paul says, I find it to be a law that when I do right, or excuse me, that, I, that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God. I love God's law in my inner being. But I see in my members, in my body, another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Paul said it. There's a war being waged within the spirit against the flesh, the flesh against the spirit. And again, Paul's not taking on a character. He's not acting. He's not pretending to be unregenerate in Romans 7. He's talking about the Christian life. It's a battle. It's a war. And we make a grave mistake if we think that being regenerate and justified now means the Christian life is going to be easy. Now I don't have to struggle with sin anymore. Nowhere in the Holy Scriptures is there a promise of the Christian life being easy. Pick up your cross and follow me doesn't equal easy. It's a battle. It's a war. And so the Apostle Peter says in our text tonight, make every effort, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue and knowledge, with self-control and steadfastness godliness and brotherly love make every effort when someone says that to you make every effort are you thinking this is going to be easy does make every effort sound like the christian life is a vacation no make every effort is a reference to the battle it's a reference to the war make every effort to do battle against sin to do the opposite of sin, to have self-control, to have steadfastness, to have virtue. Don't be unfruitful. 
Don't live as if Christ didn't die for you. Don't act as if you have not been cleansed of your sins, regenerated. Go to war with the flesh, he's saying. Put it to death, he says. Don't act like it's going to be easy. Don't expect easy. Pick up your cross and do battle. Make every effort towards self-control. Make every effort to loving your brothers in Christ. Make every effort towards godliness, towards holiness. Make every effort towards being virtuous. Make every effort to be steadfast in dying to sin and living to Christ. This is the call of the Christian. Is it easy? Absolutely not. But the good news is we aren't in on this battle, this war of the flesh and the spirit, by ourselves. We're not alone. Not only do we have, as we discussed in depth a couple of weeks ago, each other. We have each other, right? That's important. So we don't have to pretend like no one knows how we feel. We have other brothers and sisters in Christ. Not only do we have each other, which is important, we have the body of Christ. We do battle together. There's other warriors going through the same war. But even more importantly than that, and getting to our second point, we have a continual supply of strength from Christ. You see that? We have a continual supply of strength from the sanctifying power of the Spirit of Christ. That's huge. We're not left to fend for ourselves. Remember, we are united to Christ. That's what Peter says here in the opening of his epistle. His divine power. Don't you love how he starts with that? His divine power. God isn't weak. We have a powerful God. He came in the flesh and he did battle with the serpent. He's already fought and won. And yet, for Christians, the battle continues. Christ is on the throne, but we are still on the front lines, aren't we? But we're not alone. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who has called us to his own glory and excellence by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises so that through them you might become partakers of the divine nature. Partakers of the divine nature. That's something. What does that mean? Does that refer to theosis? Becoming God, as the Eastern Orthodox teach? No. We don't think we become God like the Eastern Orthodox do. That's not in the Bible. They made that up. That's probably why they teach it, because it's not biblical. We don't become God. Rather, we have become partakers in the divine nature by virtue of our union with Christ. Our union with Christ. We've been called out of darkness into light. We've been transferred from the kingdom of Satan into the kingdom of Christ. And we have been made partakers of Christ by virtue of our union with him. And thus, Peter says, we receive benefits, precious and great promises that Christ has won for us. And one of those is that we're not in this battle alone. We have the church and most importantly, we've already been united to the victor, the one who sits victoriously on the throne, who has already done battle and won, and he gives us a continual supply of sanctifying strength by virtue of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, as Peter says, the Spirit of Christ. There's another one the East hasn't wrapped their minds around, huh? The Spirit isn't merely a spirit of uh, the Spirit of God the Father, but he's the Spirit of Christ. How do we know? Well, because Peter just said that. The Spirit of Christ. The Spirit of Christ has united us to Christ, and he sanctifies us. How is it that we are sanctified? Are we sanctified by staying home by ourselves all the time? Is this how the battle is fought? Is this how we do battle? If I just stay away from everything and everyone, I can have a chance to win this war. No. It's by the Spirit of Christ working through means. And in particular, here in the Lord's Day, he works powerfully. He speaks to us and he sanctifies us through his word. Spirit of Christ receives and lifts up our prayers and our praises to the throne, interceding for us. Spirit of Christ conforms us to the image 
of God through bread and wine, the body and blood of Christ. So it's by his word and spirit, as we already confessed, that we receive a continual supply of sanctifying strength so that we would not give in to sin, so that we would not enter into temptation, but go the other way so that we would not join in on the party of sin, that we would flee from it, that we would die to it, that we would put it to death. And Christ has even granted us access, as Peter says, to these very great and precious promises that we can do battle. What are some of the things that Christ has won for us, granted us access to? Well, in addition to himself, of course, right? The victor, we're united to him. But we have access, sometimes we forget this, we have access to the armor and to the weapons that Christ has won for us. What's the armor and the weapons? Helmet of salvation, the breastplate of Christ's righteousness, the shield of faith, and don't forget the great weapon of the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. And we have continual access to the throne of grace. That which Christ used in battle, that which he has procured on our behalf, we have it continually. And by them and through them, the Spirit gives believers strength for battle. The question is not, do we have these things? The question is, do you use these things in the war of the flesh and the Spirit? You should. There's no reason why we shouldn't pick up and use them because it's in and by these things and by the continual supply of strength of the Spirit that we are able to draw from the life and death and resurrection of Christ in order to grow in the grace and knowledge of Christ, in order to die to our sin, in order to grow in the midst of spiritual war, to grow in our holiness. That brings us to our final point. Growing in grace and holiness. And I can't emphasize this enough. These are not things that we can do on our own. We do not grow in the grace and knowledge of Christ by ourselves. We do not accomplish holiness by ourselves. Growing in grace and holiness is something that we do as those who are partakers in Christ by virtue of our union with him. He's the one who enables us to make every effort. Peter said that, right? Make every effort. Well, who is it that enables us to make every effort? We do that on our own, right? We have to make every effort. We're the one who has to go do the push-ups, the spiritual push-ups and sit-ups and bench press, right? We have to make the effort. No, it's God who enables us by the power of the continual supply of the Spirit of Christ, that we are sanctified. We are enabled by the power of the Spirit to make our calling and election sure. How? By living holy lives, by applying these things that Peter already mentioned to us. And that's why Peter starts and ends this passage, this section of his epistle, with God and his power with God and his blessings, with God and his kingdom. If you are by the power of the Holy Spirit doing battle against the flesh, applying the armor and weapons given to you by God, making use of the means of grace, dying to sin and be conformed to the image of Christ, putting sin to death, practicing love and self-control and steadfastness and patience and virtue, then the one who has already saved you from the beginning who has already chosen you in Christ, is going to make sure that that is brought to completion. The one who has regenerated and justified you is going to make sure that you have the ability to do battle against the flesh. He will strengthen and confirm and enable you to die to your sin and to live holy lives in Christ. Growing in the grace and knowledge of Christ means drawing from his perfect work. It means studying and meditating on his perfect word, the sword of the Spirit, applying his death and resurrection, using his means and methods in order to do battle. And beloved, this takes effort. Make every effort. Make sure you are diligent in these things. It's not easy. It's a battle. This is a war. And as difficult as the battle gets at times, we must remember As Peter said, 
not to forget that we've been cleansed of our former sins, not to forget that we've been regenerated, that we are growing in grace. And although the spiritual war can at times be daunting, the regenerate part does overcome. Christ working in us by his spirit enables us to be made more and more holy. Christian life is not easy. The road that leads to life is narrow, and few find it, but it's worth it. And if we are diligent in this battle, if we make every effort, then what we are doing is demonstrating that our calling and election are indeed sure and true, that we have indeed been justified by the life and death and resurrection of Christ. And you've got to love how Peter closes out this section of his epistle as he encourages us to live holy lives, to supplement our faith with virtue and knowledge and steadfastness and self-control and love. He said, if you do these things, you are doing battle, the battle of self-control, the battle of virtue, the battle of knowledge in Christ, the battle of loving one another. And if you, if you take up these things and do battle, then you are growing in grace and in the fear of the Lord and in holiness. And if you do these things, Peter says, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Does he say you have to earn this and do battle on your own? No, he says there will be richly provided for you. So he begins with God's strength, with God's power, with God's promises, and he closes with God's strength, power, and promises. That really gets to the point, doesn't it? That in this war, the sanctifying spirit of Christ enables us to grow in grace and holiness. From beginning to end, it's God's power that has granted us both our partaking in Christ picking up and doing battle, and also access to his eternal kingdom. It is God's power. Amen. And thanks be to God for Christ, for his sanctifying spirit, for the continual supply of sanctifying strength, and his enabling us to do battle and grow in grace and holiness. God is the author and finisher of our salvation, including our sanctification.